Hi, welcome to my YouTube channel. I am Steve Down and this is my guitar. Um, if you've been following me for a while, you'll know that what we do here is we take a tune and we learn the solo and kind of break it down so we can analyze it melodically, harmonically, rhythmically, conceptually, um, so that it can inform you in your own improvisations. Not so you can just learn it as a party piece, although that is fun, um, but so that you can actually learn the inner workings of it and actually use some of the concepts and techniques yourself in your own improvisations. So if you follow me for a while, you'll know that I've covered guitarists such as Kenny Burrell, John Schofield, Pat Metheny, uh, Jim Hall. The last series looked at Kenny Burrell's uh, funky version of My Favourite Things. Um, and this series, Series 11, we're looking at Blues for Wallerine, which is um, uh, by Grant Green, and it's taken from his 1961 album, Grant's First Stand, um, which is on the Blue Note record label. Um, it's a really, really cool tune and is quintessentially Grant Green, so it's got all of his um, cool, funky blues lines that are on there. Um, and then also some really sophisticated jazz lines, which we're going to delve into today. And what we're going to do is we're going to learn the whole of the first solo and obviously the head as well. And I'm going to unpack it and I'm going to take it two uh, choruses at a time. Um, so it's a blues chorus. So it'll be two choruses at a time for each week. Um, and on the backing track um, for this, I've got two of um, my um, great friends and great musicians, uh, Matt Carter on Hammond Organ and Joe Harris again on Kit. Um, so it sounds amazing on the backing track, if I do say so myself. Um, so if you are a patron, you can get that over on the Patreon page and the link is here. Um, if you haven't signed up to the Patreon, what you're doing, get over to that link and sign up. You'll get the transcription, the full transcription. You'll get all of the uh, the packs uh, which have you know exercises, arpeggios, chords, scales, etc., etc. Um, you'll obviously get the full transcription of the piece, and you'll get the backing track as well. And then um, I am now doing monthly Zoom calls as well to answer any questions to do with the si the current series or anything else. Um, so keep an eye out over there as well. Um, I'd like to say a massive thank you. I realize this is a bit of a long introduction, but I'd like to say a massive thank you to all my patrons who have joined up over the last month whilst I've taken a break between series, if that's the plural. Um, and uh, we've reached 101 as of yesterday. Um, so big thanks to NB, uh, Lorenzo, Curtis, Fuzzface, Max DeVos, Gareth, Thomas, Kim, John, Eric, Chip, David, Carl, Jarek, Robert, Joseph, Paul, David, Peter, Gavin, Eric, and Wittick, who is uh, number 101. Um, so we're now in room 101. Thanks, guys. Um, so if you want to support me, then head to the Patreon page. If you don't want to do a subscription, then you can do a one-off thank you with Buy Me A Coffee link below. Um, and as always, make sure you hit the subscribe and the like button, because that really helps. And also, we'll let you know when the next part of the series is coming out. So let's get on with the lesson. Let's have a look at the head.
nature of this tune isn't too complex. Um, it is a blues and um, it's not even a jazz blues for the head. Um, the way that uh, Grant is playing it is literally just using chords one, four, and five, which are B flat, seven, E flat, seven, and F seven as well. And um, there is a cheeky G flat seven just before the F seven, so that's in there that's kind of implied. There's an awful lot of chords and harmony that's implied by the organist on there. I'm not going really, really orthodox with this and kind of showing you everything that's being implied because it's just too complex. Um, and I haven't asked Matt on the backing track to do that either because I'm I'm really a big fan of an organic process with stuff like this. So um, the, I will be referring to a couple of things that I think are worth knowing that will you know crop up time and time again or are really important to remember. But I'm not going to go too deep into every single little passing chord that is used here. But for all intents and purposes, it's chords one, four, and five over the head, and it's a very repetitive, quite easy head to play. <laughs> So it kind of resembles an awful lot of kind of like Chicago electric blues from around the, the 1950s. Um, and the, the only thing that I think that you've got to be aware of with this is just the very quick legato lines there. So you've got... So I would slow that down and make sure that it's nice and crisp and clear because it is quite fast. And then obviously we're moving it up the fret to E flat, so up to reside in the 11th position. And then back. And then we've got like a little line after that. Okay, so nothing really out there in terms of the melody line over the blues. It's very simple. It's something that you'd hear quite a lot. Um, it's very clear that the blues itself is a vehicle for Grant's expression and the main part of the show is gonna be his solo. So it's very clear from this that Grant probably has thought, yeah, this is a great melody line, this works, let's get into the solo. Um, that's my feeling on it. I don't think he's kind of, you know, overthought the melody line for the head at all. Um, so let's move into the solo itself. So here is the first chorus of the solo. <laughs> Okay, so over the first part of this solo, right from the off, um, Grant is going quite sophisticated with the sound. He's chosen not to use um, anything kind of like too pentatonic -y over the top of it. Um, what he's actually using, he's actually playing an F minor arpeggio over the top of it. Um, and you know, you could see it as an F minor pentatonic if you add in that E flat on there. Um, he doesn't play the E flat, but uh, you know, it's, it, I think it's quite obvious that that's kind of what he wants to do there, to use an F minor arpeggio, add the B flat in. And th the reason why this is really cool is, uh, and something worth learning is because the fact that if you play an F minor arpeggio over the top of the B flat, obviously not only does it sound cool, but the reason why it sounds cool is because the C, which is the fifth of the F minor arpeggio, acts as the ninth of B flat seven. So you get this kind of sound, okay, which is quite nice. And then the A flat of the F minor arpeggio, which is the flat third, um, acts as the flat seven over B flat. So that, you know, ties you in with the chord. You've got a nice chord, chord tone there. And then the F obviously acts as the fifth. So you've got the ninth, the flat seven, and the fifth of B flat there. So you're creating a B flat nine, a dominant nine kind of sound, which is cool, very bluesy and very sophisticated. Slides. Okay, and then we're on off to the races with some enclosure next. Um, so here's the F minor arpeggio um, over an F minor chord, so you can hear exactly what it sounds like. And then here's an F minor arpeggio, again, played over the top of a B flat chord, a B flat seven underneath. I would urge you to practice making sure you know what the sound of the F minor is over the top of that B flat chord. And then you can do some experimentation with actually improvising with it.
Okay, so the next two bars that we've got in this chorus. Okay, this is quite a fun line. There's tons of stuff here. Again, Grant's going super, super sophisticated here, but also kind of retaining a bluesy nature. Um, the main thing that I want to talk about here is the enclosure that he's doing, okay? So the main enclosure that he's got here is in bar 17. Moving to the E flat seven, spelling out an E flat seven chord. Um, so if you don't know what enclosure is, basically enclosure is where you pick a target note. In this case, Grant has picked the B flat quite clearly. Um, and that's outlining the chord that's underneath. Um, and enclosure is basically where you go above and then below and then you hit the note itself. Now there's many ways of doing that because you know which note above, which note below. So I've put here four examples which is a diatonic enclosure and a diatonic enclosure is basically where you take a diatonic note above the target note and a diatonic note below the target note. So in this case our target note I've put as D because um, quite a lot of enclosure is around the major third. And the diatonic enclosure in the exercise is going E flat to C to D. And that's diatonic to the key of B flat. So, okay, so that's a diatonic enclosure. A chromatic enclosure is basically where you take chromatic notes, notes that are not diatonic to the key of B flat. So in this case, it will be E, D flat, and then D. Okay, so still ending on that target note, going above, going below, and then hitting the target note. And then you can do a combination as well. So a combination would be a diatonic note above and a chromatic note below or vice versa. And what I've chosen to do here is the example is a diatonic note above and a chromatic note below, which is, okay, and that you get that quite a lot. Grant Green uses that one quite a lot. So, um, and then the final one is a four note combination where basically you go above diatonically and then you go below, but quite far below. So I've chosen to go to C and then you gradually move up chromatically to your target note. So E flat, C, D flat, D. And that is a four note combination. And obviously you can extend it, you could do a five note. Um, whatever it is, it's basically where you've taken a target note and then you've enclosed it above and below. <laughs> In bar 18, and then kind of going on further into 19 and 20, we see Grant using some chord tones. This isn't the only place in, in here where he uses chord tones, but I've just chosen to single this out. Um, using chord tones um, in a solo is really important because it does spell out the harmony underneath and it makes sure your solo, it pulls the solo together harmonically, makes a very stable melody. Um, and I think it's a really good idea to make sure that you know what the chord tones are in reference to the chords. You don't want your solo to sound really boring, you know, with being just chord tones. Obviously you want to throw some extra things in there as well, some scale tones and some you know outside tones as well. But it's important to basically know the skeleton structure. And and in bar 18, it's very clear that Grant does know his skeleton structure because he hits um, over the top of an E flat seven chord, he hits the major third, which is the G, then the tonic, and then the flat seven. Very clearly spelling out an E flat seven chord. And then in bar 19, he puts in a nine. And then in bar 20, he actually hits a major third to make, move you back to the B flat seven again. So to basically shout to the listener, I'm not playing E flat anymore. I'm now playing B flat, just in case you didn't know. So it's really important that you make sure that you know uh, your chord tones going on underneath. And so here's an exercise just for the first four bars of a blues, um, basically spelling out the chord tones. And you can carry this on throughout the rest of the 12 bars. Basically the parameters that I've set is that um, if I do one arpeggio, I go all the way up and then I connect it with the nearest note from the next arpeggio. So. <laughs> So that I, there I've landed on A flat over the top of the B flat chord. The nearest note for the next chord, E flat, the nearest note is G, which is the major third of E flat. And then I've carried on up. And then I've just decided to come back down again. You can decide whenever you like when to come back down. Nearest note is that major third of B flat. And I've got two bars. 
bars of it there. And if I run out of notes, I just come back up again. Um, that's literally the only kind of parameters that I've set there is that you go fully up the arpeggio or fully down the arpeggio. And whenever you've run out of quarter notes in the bar, so you've done your four quarter notes, then you look for the nearest tone um, for the next chord to spell out the next chord. Have fun with that. Okay, in the next um, few bars, um, the next chord we've got in bar 21, G7, is what's known as a secondary dominant. Um, a secondary dominant is basically where you take any diatonic chord that is a minor, so in the key of B flat, G is chord six and should be uh, a minor, uh, diatonically speaking. But if you make it a seven, then it becomes a secondary dominant. And here, over the top of that secondary dominant, uh, Grant's playing some outside sound here. Um, and the, the best way of looking at these outside tones, Okay, that Grant's putting in here, is to see it as almost like a D blues scale. Okay. If you see it as a D minor blues scale here, it's a lot easier to digest what's going on, rather than thinking um, of the altered notes, the altered tones that are going on there. Because within the D minor blues scale, you've got all of the sophistication you need to be able to play over the top of a G7. Um, so you've got your D, which is your fifth, You've got the F, which is your flat seven, the G, which is your tonic, and then the flat nine there. Okay, and then you've also got the A, which is going to be your ninth note as well. So, and then 11th, and then going back to the fifth again. Now, I don't think Grant would have been thinking like this at all. I think what Grant would have been thinking is G7 with a flat nine added onto the top of it. But the reason why I'm putting this out here is that people like Schofield adopt this idea of finding pentatonics that create an altered sound to play over a different dominant chord because they contain some of the altered notes. So what I would encourage you to do is to take the D minor blues scale, making sure that you've got the emphasis on that blue note, which is the flat nine, in relation to G7 and have a go at improvising with it over the top of a G7 like Grant's done here. And for the remaining four bars, the two, five, one in B flat, C minor seven, F seven, B flat seven for the last two bars. Um, Grant is basically playing some really nice bebop lines here, um, outlining the chords adding in some chromaticism. So we see him um, in bar 22. Okay, so he starts off in the E flat and then to C, and then basically takes that sequence down, that minor third sequence. Okay, really and truthfully, it should be a minor seven, but it just creates a nice bit of tension. Okay, creating an enclosure around the C, and then running up the scale. And then we've got a sequence running down F, starting on the nine. Okay, really nice sequence. And then ending off. And what really makes this resolution really nice is the fact that um, you've got notes from F7 there. So a C and an A there from the F7. And that's also a leading note going back to B flat. So that's really nicely rounded off. And then to lead you back into the next chorus, he goes to the note of F. And that's a really good thing to do because that gives you tension to set up, to resolve. And this little line here is a line that we're gonna you know, hear an awful lot in this solo. So make sure that you learn that, that line because he will edit it ever so slightly. He'll um, play around with it, but it is gonna come back quite a bit. Um, so let's take a look now at the second chorus. Okay, so second chorus. Um, in this one, we're using far more um, pentatonic language. So he's using here the B flat minor pentatonic with the added major third. Here's the B flat minor pentatonic. Mm -hmm. 
And when I say with the major third, he's basically punctuating the sound of the dominant chord, because remember a dominant chord is made up of a root, third, fifth, and flat seven. And the major third is the bit that differentiates it between a minor seven. So um, here, the first line that Grant plays, there's the punctuation of the major third. Now that's a standard thing that you'll hear in a lot of jazz blues is. really really cool because as we just saw in the last segment um, he's still using those chord tones so he's he's very cleverly linking the major third and using that same idea of using the major third the tonic and the uh, flat seven of E flat seven over the top of that E flat chord um, just varying it slightly playing two E flats even going as far as to use the ninth again over the top of it to really make it sound nice and bluesy. Um, but this time, instead of it landing on beat two, it's landing on beat one here. Um, and then coming back with some more pentatonic ideas in the next bar in bar 32. And then we've got that idea again in bar 33. And this is a, a major sixth kind of idea adding in the sixth in there. And this is this is kind of like a, a Charlie Christian kind of idea, something that Grant's probably picked up off of Charlie Christian. And then bar 34, more enclosure. And this time we've got that four note enclosure going to up to B flat, down to G, chromatically through, um, heading towards that major third of the F7 chord that's coming up next. So he's preempting that F7 chord and using some enclosure, really sophisticated. Okay, um, and then the next part. Okay, now this is a really cool thing that he's doing here. First off, he's using some uh, altered ideas. So um, very clearly outlining an F7 flat nine idea. So C, E flat, and then go straight to the G flat there, which is the flat nine of, of F. So, and then what he's doing here is resolving it back to the F. So resolving it back to the root and then now the clever thing that he's doing here, and this is a line worth taking out here and using and manipulating, changing the rhythm slightly, putting it in different places just to make it a bit more your own. But basically what he's doing is he's running up um, at four notes, starting on the fifth, and then going down to start on the major third of F7, and then going down again to start on the root. And that's all over the top of the B flat seven. Now this idea spans over two chords and he's using F7 as the basis for this idea. But if you notice, it spans over the top of bars 35 and 36, which are F7 and B flat seven, okay? And so over the top of th bar 36, he ends up putting an F major triad over the top of a B flat seven chord. Now that works purely because of the fact that the F is the fifth the A is the seventh, the C is the nine, and the E flat is the eleventh. Okay, so we've got a nice sophisticated sound that does fit into B flat. However, it's B flat seven, so surely shouldn't it be an A flat? And that does clash. If you hear here, I'm playing a B flat um, underneath, but I'm actually playing the F seven arpeggio over the top of it, and it does clash. So have a listen. Now the reason why this works and he's able to get away with it is not only is it, it's very, very clearly a very strong resolution, but also it's part of a sequence that we've already heard for a full bar beforehand. So, okay, so our ear is already moving towards the resolution of that. No matter what the chord is underneath, we're already moving towards a resolution. So with that in mind, when you're doing your improvisations and you start off with a sequence, do try and make it tie in with the harmony underneath like Grant does for the first bar. But if it doesn't quite fit for the next bar, don't worry too much about it as long as it's a very strong resolution there at the end. And then in bar 37, the next bar, <laughs> We're setting us ourselves up for the uh, the next chorus, which we'll look at next week. We'll look at chorus three and four. But again, you can see it's that same line that's coming back again, just slightly different this time. Instead of it's just 
Okay, but this is, like I said, this is a classic thing in the early 60s for blue note records, for guitarists. These lines do come back time and time again. And it is something that, you know, he's influenced by Charlie Christian on this one. So I hope you got something out of this. Make sure that you do take all of this stuff away and put it to practice in your own improvisations. Don't just play it as a party piece. It's a good thing to be able to do to learn solos through. Um, but I think also it's a good thing to be able to make sure that you use the concepts, the ideas, the techniques, harmonic, rhythmic, melodic, um, and use them in your own solos. So it's very easy for you to be able to put together a blues. If you go over on Patreon, you can download the backing track and have a play along with it. Um, but if you can't do that, then you can quite easily get a loop pedal or you can record it as a voice memo on your phone um, and play along to it and try and use some of the concepts. So happy practicing, and I will see you next week for choruses three and four. Bye.